Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome. Uh, really warm welcome to today's Big Brave. With uh, we're really, really pleased to have Jordan Kemp from Bars, the AG Bars, who you may have heard of one of their products, Iron Brew, but they do do a lot of other products as well. So we're really delighted to have him along with us today and, and give you the chance to ask him any questions that you want to ask him about his career and, and any tips that he's got for you going forward. But before I get to all that, um, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping rules just so that you know how to participate in today's event. Uh, at any time during the webinar, um, you'll have the opportunity to submit your questions. To, to do so, just type your, your question into the Q&A function at the bottom of the control panel at the bottom of your screen. Um, as time allows, I'll, I'll try and get through as many questions as we can during the session. Um, and at the end, we'll be recording the webinar and we'll share the link after the event. And if we don't get through all the questions, don't worry, uh, you'll get a written response to any unanswered questions that will be sent out to all participants after it. And after it, you can also email any questions you have to careers at glasgow.ac.uk and we'll make sure they get answered as well. So what is the Big Brave? Well, the Big Brave is, is the closing event for each of our major career spheres. Uh, it offers you the opportunity to hear a career story from, it says here, an ambitious and accomplished person. So that, that's you, Jonathan, ambitious and accomplished, who's achieved success due to their bravery, passion, and sheer determination to make an impact. And the Q&A is designed to answer the pressing questions that are relevant to you right now and to the future. So we've got lots of big braves uh, scheduled this semester and I just would recommend you to have a look at Glasgow Careers to find out more about our other great speakers. So Jonathan, who is Jonathan Kemp? Well, you've probably read, hopefully, the, the blurb about him, but I'll just go through that today just so that you've all got that clear in your mind. Uh, Jonathan joined the board of AG Bar in 2003, uh, having started his career in FMCG, which is Fast Moving Consumer Goods at P&G, or sorry, Procter & Gamble, some 12 years earlier. And prior to this, he studied economics at the University of Liverpool, but we won't hold that against him, uh, and served at the Royal, in the Royal Navy Reserve and spent a year at the House of Commons as a research assistant. I don't know which one would require more bravery, the Royal Navy Reserve or being a House of Commons research assistant, but maybe you can tell us that we go through, John. Um, he leads a, the team at Bar Soft Drinks that are responsible for the customer management, commercial management, innovation and marketing of brands such as Rubicon, Bar, Strathmore, and of course, Iron Brew. And he's responsible as a board member for the governance and strategic direction of the overall business. He describes his day job as long-term brand and long-term people building, driving growth in both the business and the organization. And he says it's the best job in Scotland. I can't think of a better one myself either. Jonathan also serves on a voluntary basis as the chair of Glasgow Riders, Scotland's largest youth cycling club, and as a non-executive director of, of Scottish cricket, quite interesting. Um, so I've got a few questions up my sleeve just now, but afterwards, uh, it'll be it's your opportunity to ask your own questions. So be thinking of what you'd like to learn from Jonathan and, and put your answers in the Q&A box and we'll, we'll get through as many as we can. So Jonathan, welcome. Thank you very much for uh, coming, up, well, coming along, for being in your, in your uh, office and uh, helping us through, through Zoom. Um, Thank you for having me. Great. Um, I just wondered if we could start, if, if you could give us a, a brief history of your, your career thus far. What have, you, what have you been your career highs, if, if I can use that term so far, if you just talk us through your, your story? Yeah, um, I remember shortly after joining Procter & Gamble, um, I was uh, working on a couple of brands. One was um, Always and one was uh, Tampax. And I remember thinking, you know, when I grew up and you, people say, what do you want to do? Not actually sitting there and thinking, that's what I want to do. You know, dad, you must let me do this. This is what I must do. Um, and, and it's funny how I think during your career, you know, you, you have to make choices. And I think the evaluation of those choices is, is, is key. Um, and, and, you know, life in many ways is about choices. Um, Look, my background, I just went to a sort of normal comprehensive school. Probably one of the most um, defining things I did was actually I got a job aged 13 at Curry's, the electrical shop. Um, those days it was called Saturday Lad. And the first two weeks they sent me out on the van, but I was a bit, um, bit of a, a wuss and I kept dropping the washing machine. So they said, well, you better go in the shop. And 
I worked there for the next seven years and basically I just learned about people and I really enjoyed working with people and in particular selling and, and understanding the, the difference between sort of what say were features and benefits of the products. Um, and I think that was quite key for me. I, I didn't really want to go to university. Nobody in my family had been to university. Um, and I was sitting at school and the local MP came in and it was prize giving something. And, you know, he mentioned that he had this sort of uh, job as a, a research assistant that people had done. This was about three years before um, I was due to sort of finish up at school. And, you know, I sort of thought I, I quite like to do that. So I went to see him, just booked an appointment, went through the door and said, look, I'd like to do this job that you've got. And he said, well, I don't have that job anymore. And I said, well, I think you should, and I'd like to do it. And anyway, I think he was taken aback, but he took me on for a year. So I worked at the House of Commons for a year, and it taught me two things. The first was um, I, I didn't want to work in politics. That became very clear very quickly. But secondly, I did need to go and get a degree. There were clearly jobs that I wanted to do, but having a degree was a sort of mandatory point of entry. So, um, you know, I, I ended up going to Liverpool to study economics, um, uh, there was a leading monetarist economist there called Patrick Minford, who I used to, um, was my tutor. And, um, you know, I enjoyed the economics. I also tried to do lots of other things. I joined the Royal Navy on day one uh, as, a, as an officer in, in the sort of reserve, the University Royal Naval Unit, as it was called. But in the second year, I did get around to thinking about, well, what am I going to do? And there was definitely a choice to go and join the Navy. But I was walking through the uh, career service and I saw a poster about the summer internships at um, Procter & Gamble. And it, you know, it, it just sort of thought, well, let, let's have a look at that. Um, and they were advertising them in brand management and sales management. And if you did the sales management, you got a company car. So that really sealed that. That was pretty clear which one I was going to go for. Um, and I joined Procter & Gamble for the summer. Um, it was a very exhaustive interview process, um, you know, and I'll talk a bit more about that because there's a lot of learning come out of that. But they offered me this uh, internship and the first four weeks wasn't sure. The last eight weeks, I absolutely loved it. And they offered me a job at the end of that um, summer internship. And I'd done a lot of work into evaluating the effectiveness of sales promotions. Um, using a combination of some of the stuff I'd done at university in economics and econometrics uh, with the data that, you know, it's very data rich, Procter & Gamble. So when they offered me the job, I said, yeah, great, but how about I start next week? And I said, what do you mean? I said, well, I'll go and still finish off my degree. I'll do my final year. But if you give me the company car, the computer and expenses, I'll carry on doing work for you across the next year. It was a good try, but I didn't get the company car. Um, but I carried on basically doing a load of uh, research as part of my degree. So that was great. So it counted for 25% of my degree and, and actually was quite groundbreaking in terms of bringing uh, sort of econometrics to bear on the sort of retail data that they had. So I joined Procter & Gamble, I think, try to remember, 1993, um, you know, started off in sales management, um, worked on a number of brands, um, you talk about sort of brave decisions. Probably one of the bravest decisions I took was after about five or six years at p and you know, I'd risen to this level of sales manager, you know, bigger company car, et cetera. Um, and I left on the Friday as a sales manager and I went back in on the Monday and started as an assistant brand manager. It's the lowest level in marketing. So I very deliberately tried to um, broaden my career by working on, both the sales and the marketing side, the, the, the sort of brand management side. And I think that that really put me in, in, in good, um, a, a good place because it, it just broadened my uh, commerciality, I would say. That's really interesting. And there's a, there's a lot of really good lessons in there, uh, which I'd love to expand on, but I'm, I'm going to not do that because I really want the students to, to get time to ask questions. But it's interesting. I can't not comment on the fact that, you know, it's interesting that, You've, you've described your career as a journey where you didn't necessarily know where you were going to end up, but at every time you, you've seen opportunities, you've kept curious, you've kept active, and I think there's a lot of reflection in there. You've, you've been reflecting at times of, okay, what am I enjoying about this? What 
could this lead to what would I like to do next? You're, you're always thinking and reflecting, and I think that's that's really really important. Um, one of, one of the things that we talk about a lot at the moment, and you'll you'll have heard this yourself, is is the resilience and the need for people to be resilient, and especially today, you know, with with all the stuff that's going on. Have you had any setbacks along the way in your career? Would you say, and, and how did you deal with those? Any disappointments or anything like that, and how did you deal with them? Yeah, look, I think um, there's definitely been times when I thought, oh, I've I've definitely made the wrong call here. So, you know, 12 years at Procter & Gamble, things are going well. It's quite an international business. So you're starting to talk about your next assignment as being uh, abroad, etc. cetera. Um, but I'd come to the conclusion that, that actually that wasn't for me. And I wanted to be more running a, a, an actual business and, um, you know, the opportunity came up to join the board of AG Bar. I was only 32 at the time, so, so quite young. Um, you know, suddenly going to be responsible for 500 people and, you know, multi-site and all this sort of stuff. Um, and, that, and that was quite a big call to leave this sort of Procter & Gamble um, sort of offices in Weybridge in Surrey and move into, you know, uh, Parkhead, um it was quite it was quite a shock and you talk about resilience and you're sort of sitting in there and actually there's a little bit of rain coming in the roof and you're thinking mm, i made the right choice here um and look I, I i'm very happy now that i did make the right choice but i have to say you know the first four weeks of joining a new business particularly as um everybody was just sort of assuming because of your position that you knew all the right answers. So there was a real sort of almost deference that would go back probably quite to the old sort of bars days. You know, when I first turned up, people started calling me Mr. Jonathan. I'm like, what, what, what? <laughs> sorry, what? But obviously there were more than one bar on the board. So they would disting, um, distinguish themselves by being either Mr. Robin, say, or Mr. Michael, etc. And I say, look, could you just call me Jonathan, please? Yes, 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 Mr. Kemp, I'll call you Jonathan. <laughs> So, so it, it, you know, that was quite challenging. And actually, I think if, if I look at my time at bars, it's, it's a bit, you know, bookended in that it was challenging clearly to start with. And actually the last three or four years have been hugely challenging. Um, and, you know, things like the introduction of the sugar tax or the concern around sugar, massive impact on our business. Um, things like COVID. I mean, earlier this year, it was like living in a, uh, disaster recovery exercise every day, trying to work out how we kept operations going and our people safe. So, um, yeah, look, resilience is key. And I feel for all the students who are going to be going out there to try and get employment at the moment. Um, you know, it is tough. It's probably the toughest it's been. Um, you know, there's always cyclical recessions coming and, you know, employment going up or down. But But this is a little bit unprecedented you know and, and I think it will have an impact for a, a decent period of time I, I do think though that you know on the assumption things do get sorted either from a vaccine front or, or whatever that employment will return quite quickly I think this will be more v-shaped than u-shaped and um, you know I think it's about what people can do to put themselves in the best possible position um, over the next sort of period of time however long that is the, the other thing I would just reflect on is, you know, people are going to be working for 40 years now. And, and, you know, 12 tough months at the start of that, I think you have to put that in the context of looking uh, on a long-term career. Yeah, thanks a lot. I think that's, that's great. Thank you. I think it's important for people to get that perspective, isn't it? That this is bad just now, but it, it's not permanent. And it'll, it, when it does end, it's, we'll have a quick recovery. That's great Great to think about that. And hopefully that will be the case. Um, this is quite a tough question, but I'd, I'd like to ask it anyway. If, if, you, if you could go back and speak to yourself at the stage that our audience are at just now at university, if you could go back in time, what advice would you give yourself? It's a very good question, Stephen. Um, and the answer is probably going to sound a bit odd um, but there's a lot more to life than work 
I, you know, I, I believe that people should work hard and, you know, put in a decent shift and stuff. But probably in my early days, I just prioritized work too much. Um, and, you know, I think having that, that balance would have been better. Um, you know, fortunately, I actually got married, I think, age 22. So I was married quite young as well. I seem to have lived everything quite sort of fast forward. But, you know, I was married at 22 and we had our first sort of child at 25. But certainly over that early time, stuff I thought was really, really important actually with experience and reflection. I think probably the first thing about getting the balance of work life is, is something that people can um, hopefully you know, appreciate and understand. I think the piece about not worrying about everything, I think that's much harder. And I think that's something that does need to come with experience. That's really interesting. I mean, work-life balance is something that we talk a lot about as careers advisors in terms of, of values and, and things. We've got a follow-up question to that um, from somebody, so I'll just ask that. Um, <clears throat> you said that you, you wish you didn't prioritise work as much, but do you think that if you didn't, you'd still be where you are today? That's a really good question, isn't it? So, Yeah, and I guess it's, it's quite a hard question to, to answer. Um, I think probably on balance I would. And I think it was, you know, if I've done a piece of work to, to 97%, trying to get it to, to 99% and, and putting that effort in when 97% would do. Um, I know this is a strange message to be giving, um, but it, you know, I, look, I think, it, I think it a lot comes to what businesses are looking for in people. I also think the current thing that we're going through will actually change a lot of things. Um, and I personally can't see us going back to the type of working uh, environment that we were before. I mean, I typically would, you know, be away a couple of nights a week. I would travel to London for one hour meetings and stuff. Um, I can't quite see that happening. I, I think in many ways, you know, I've, I've gained a lot of time and been more effective over the last few months. I think there'll be a hybrid approach. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's uh, really interesting. And I think we've even noticed that here in our own uh, working lives that a lot of the, I think what the COVID has done is accelerated the changes. We, we could see the changes going. We knew what was happening. We've got more home working, more flexibility, yeah. um, all of that, and more, you know, t use of tech, maybe slightly less traveling. But now, Who's going to get in a plane if you're now used to using Zoom or you're used to doing this? You're, you're not going to do that as much. I think, I think you're right. I think it has changed things probably forever. Uh, okay. Um, one other thing. I'd like to ask you another couple more questions. Feel free. We've had one in the Q&A, but come on, let's get more in. Let's get more in. Um, how, how, I wanted to ask you this. It's a bit, it's a bit of a, a daft question in a way, but how responsible do you feel when you're dealing with the future of a nationally iconic brand and product. I mean, we've all grown up with Andrew. I can still remember uh, a song from my childhood, which I've been told not to sing uh, in this seminar, so I wouldn't sing it. Um, you've probably heard that you've probably gone through all the old adverts and then Made in Scotland from, from Girders um, and all of that. So how, how do you feel a weight of responsibility and what, what's that like? Yeah, you do. Um, there's no doubt. And I'm very conscious of the, the history of the brand. One of the things I've, I've done and, um, you know, is really research the history of the business and the brand. Because you know what, there's a lot of things, strangely, that have come up in the past that, that, that come up again. So, you know, look, it, it, it's bad at the moment to, to try and be operating the business, let's be clear. But it's not as bad as it was in 1939 or 1942 when, as Robin will tell you, the government decided that um, Iron Brew had to be taken off the market. They were going to have six flavours, and because the decision was taken in Westminster, um, Iron Brew wasn't on the list. So Iron Brew actually came off the market until 1947. So that that's obviously a much bigger challenge to a business than, than what we're dealing with now. So I think, you know, you talk about resilience, and if you look at it, I, I was once in a board meeting and Robin was there, and he, you know, the economic indicators were starting to head the wrong way. And he said, Oh, I think this will be my eighth for a session. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I think, I think this, this sense of history, this sense of head legacy, you know, and 
with the responsibility, you know, you have to make some big decisions. I mean, the, the response to the sugar levy was a key one. I'm sure amongst the participants, there were some people who think, well, that wasn't the right thing to do to reduce the sugar level. There'll be others who think it was the right thing to do. But ultimately, you know, you've got to try and take those decisions as a business based on consumer insight. Um, and, and that's what you know do what one day i will hang up my iron brew uh, bag and you know what i want to make sure is the brand is in better health when, when i hand it over than it was when i picked it up but iron brew will be around a lot longer than i will that's for certain and me too I sh yeah absolutely uh, great some great questions coming in thanks give me some more um right there's a couple i definitely want to get in the first one is it, it it's really it kind of goes on from what we were talking about when you were saying you were giving people advice. Um, you described the interview process at P&G as quite exhaustive. Could you maybe talk about some of the main takeaways from that process? And I think it probably means any you know, typical process, even from yourselves, the AG bar, those kind of processes. So could you maybe talk about some of the main takeaways from that and how to perform well in those kind of processes? It's obviously relevant to them, uh, uh, to us at this stage, he's saying, which is, which is true. Yeah, so, look, I'd love to, and you know, hopefully, I can share some things that will will help people um, as as they go for interviews in the future. Um, during my time at, at PNG, I was responsible for recruitment from first Liverpool, then Durham, and then Cambridge University. And I think over my time, I must have interviewed well over a thousand undergraduates and and, and recent graduates. Um, you know, the first thing to remember is in an interview the people on the other side of the table are looking to base uh, a decision based on what you are telling them. And quite simply, my best indicator of what you are going to do in the future is what you have done in the past. So just remember that the best indicator of what you're going to do in the future is what you're going to do in the past. Um, and that's why, people are looking for examples and they are looking for examples that basically tick certain boxes. And, you know, it, it, it's relatively straightforward really, because those, those boxes, they'll be called different things depending on whether you go to Mars or you go to Unilever or you go to Procter and Gamble or you have an interview with AG bar. They might call those competencies different things, but they're all broadly the same. And what you need to do in the interview is demonstrate that you have shown those competencies in the past. And the best way to do that is to think of it in the context of something called CAR. Okay. So CAR standing for context, what action you took, not we took, but you took, and what was the result of that action. And if you, for each of those competencies can go into an interview with at least three examples, you will be in a much better position than if you're trying to sit in the interview and come up with them at the time. What are the competencies? Well, you know, initiative and follow through. That's always going to be a competency. When did you show initiative? Um, leadership of others. Uh, or personal leadership, that's always going to be a competency. Um, you're probably going to have creativity and innovation. Um, you're going to have working effectively as part of a team. And you're also probably going to have something around data analysis and problem solving. Okay. Um, and that's about it, really. In terms of the actual interview itself, the one thing I would say, this is the one golden piece of advice smile okay the number of people who come into an interview terrified you know and concerned and it it just hits their let's call it their performance in an interview you are acting you know you are trying to put the best possible uh, presentation of yourself across now look as an interviewer if i've got someone who's really nervous i will do everything i can to put them at ease etc but you know what? It's a lot easier for me if somebody comes in and smiles and looks like they're enjoying the interview. Um, and look, practice. That's the other thing. Um, just practice. Um, you know, do it on yourselves, your friends. You know, it, it, 
it just becomes easier as well. The, the other factor that, you know, particularly the, the, the students listening to this are probably going to have to contend with is doing it online. Um, and again, that's really difficult. And again, I feel for the students who find themselves in that position. But, you know, again, prepare. So, you know, try and get yourself into a quiet environment. Make sure the interconnections, internet connection's good. Um, I've got a couple of spotlights set up here um, that, you know, I put for when I'm using these types of calls. Just a little bit of preparation and a little bit more asking questions back. I know I'm sort of blethering on this morning a bit. That's the nature of this thing. But if this was an interview, a true interview, I would be coming back to you, Stephen, and saying, did that answer your question? Is there anything about that that you want me to clarify? Does that help give an example of what you were looking for? Or shall I give another one? So ask questions back. Make it more like a conversation if you can. Yes. Yeah. Well, honestly, I think I should just wrap up and just record that. And instead of doing interview seminars, just play that back. Because that was just exactly bang on what we see. So that's great. To, so thanks very much for that. That was fantastic. Really great advice, folks. You must listen to that. It's some of the best advice I've ever heard from an employer, honestly. So do that, please. Uh, somebody's asked me to sing the Iron Bruce song. I'm not going which, to do that. Which one, which one is it, Stephen? Oh, no, you're going to make me do it. Now. No, 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 no. Which one is it? I'm just interested. It's that song. It's from the 60s, I think. I'm very thirsty. I'm thirsty too. Here's a brick drink that's good for us, bars Iron Brew. Have you not heard that? That's that's really old. Steve. I know. Of course, I'm 59. I know. It's very very old. You can you can you can tell somebody's age by when you talk about the advertising strap line. So yep. there's those who remember Scotland's other national drink, through to made in Scotland from Gerda's, through to see what Iron Brew can do for you, um, and then you've got gets you through, um, phenomenal, um, don't be a can't be a can, these types. So you can actually tell. So I'm ancient then, because I, I've even... Yeah, that, <laughs> I didn't like to much. say, but that, that's, that's, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not going to sing it. I'm, I'm now tempted, I'm so tempted to, but I'm, I'm going to hold my, my I'm going to rein myself in here. Okay, um, somebody has said a couple of questions. I think they're quite, they're really good. I'm going to run the two of them together because they're from the same person. Um, what is your idea of success in life? Who do you look at and think of as successful? And she said, sorry if that question is a bit intense, who, who is your inspiration or somebody you look up to and what's your your, your definition of, of success is actually, I really, I'm really interested in that. So if you could answer that one. Yeah, I think, yeah, there are some people I'm sure in, in life who have a very, very specific goal that they want to reach. And, you know, that's, that is their goal. They must, they must reach that goal. And, that's that's great uh, and that works for some people i've i've never been in that position i've been one of these people who has i think it's important i enjoy what i do and if i'm enjoying what i'm doing i'm happy be that in work or be that outside of work i genuinely enjoy 90 percent of the time what i do at work and I, I you know i particularly like working with customers you know, when you make an advert and you see that advert for the first time on the television, you know, you, you take a huge amount of satisfaction from that. Um, in terms of success outside of work, that becomes, I think, more important to you as, as you progress in your career and probably relates to what I was talking about earlier. So, you know, I've got I've got two children, you know, one who's still a student, one who's just started as a, as a junior doctor. And I take a huge amount of, um, I don't know what the right word would be, but you know, they, 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 they mean a huge amount to me as you would expect, but I'm, I'm probably more interested in what they're doing now than, than what I'm doing. Um, and also, you know, with my wife as well, I enjoy cycling, um, cricket nut. Um, so you know, talked about being on the board of cricket Scotland. My, my boss relentlessly took the piss out of me for many years about this, you know, Scotland cricket and then of course on um, June 2018 they beat England at cricket uh, over at the Grange and he hasn't mentioned it since so that's fantastic so yes. you know I, I, that, as you get older I think trying to broaden some of the things I do I and mean, it's quite difficult you, you know when you've got young children they can be all consuming and you know it's right that you put your time there as you get older 
and you get more time just really thinking about, well, what do I want to do? Um, as I say, you know, I'm, I'm very happy when I'm out on my bike cycling up the hills around where I live. Excellent. That's a great answer. Thanks very much for that. Um, I'm just looking at um, some other questions that we've got coming in. Uh, a lot of thanks. Great interview. Thanks. Brilliant. Somebody said, thanks. That's very helpful. What are your thoughts on marketing in the digital space? Uh, this person's uh, in thoughts of whether you should pursue a strategic marketing master's or a, or a digital marketing degree. I mean, that's a bit technical. What, what would you say to that? Yeah, look, um, marketing is undoubtedly changing hugely. Um, and it, it, you know, I, I'm actually, um, put a confession here. I'm involved with the university of Strathclyde. Um, so, um, I'm halfway through a PhD in behavioral economics. Um, but I also, um, teach a, or about to start teaching a course in, in FMCG for fourth year marketing students there. And it's quite interesting, the difference between the sort of academic approach to marketing and the more practical approach to marketing. And I think the best universities are starting to try and pull those two things together. And, you know, particularly around digital, it is moving so quickly that it's quite hard at times to um, keep up to pace with it. Um, for example, I, you know, we, we use an advertising agency called The Leaf, and I regularly will just go and say to particularly the young people in the agency there, can you just tell me what's going on, please? Um, please bring me up to speed with what's happening. Um, I think there's a lot to go in the future. I think um, blockchain will potentially mean in FMCG that we can almost trace individual products to individual people going forward. And I think that could be quite a revolution in how you have that relationship with um, individual consumers, even direct to consumer. You know, we've seen massive changes um, in the last, uh, last few months in terms of people obviously buying online and having products delivered. I mean, look this year, um, well, not so much this year, next year in a normal year, let's say I will be investing more than 50% of our money in digital routes to reach consumers. And uh, I've just seen that increase each year. Yep. Yep. That's really interesting. Thanks very much for that. Um, I think there's, there's some few people wanting some real nuggets to help them in their studies as well. So I'll, 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 I will indulge them a bit. So let, let, me, let me ask you this one. Um, hi, I'm writing a dissertation about the sales effect of the increasing use of Scottishness within product advertising and marketing with a specific focus on Iron Brew. How do you find managing such an iconic brand and how do you and the team think about Iron Brew and other AG, AG bar products in the context of Scotland? Thank you. I don't know. Yeah. How, I'm asking yeah. it because it's there, but it's a tough one. No, look, it, it, it came home to me once. I was sitting in a, in a focus group and it was quite an unusual focus group because it was um, 12 year old boys and they're quite unruly. So I'm behind a piece of, they can't see me, but I can see them. You have to have it moderated, as you can imagine, with certain controls and stuff. And they're, they're, they're messing about a bit. But eventually, we managed to get a question out of them. You know, why, why do you like Iron Brew? And this boy said, I like Iron Brew because it tastes phenomenal and it's Scottish. But I think it was quite interesting because it was that it tastes phenomenal. Oh, and it's Scottish. And I think the, the lesson I took out of that, and you can sometimes get these sort of eureka moments out of qualitative research, mm -hmm. is, you know, we shouldn't be going out and say, buy Iron Brew, it's Scottish. It's almost in the DNA of the product. It's woven into it. And you know what? It just comes out naturally. And the best thing about the brand is you just need to nurture that and let that happen. Um, we sell a huge amount of Iron Brew in England, people I think, tend to forget that, you know, at the end of the day, there's a huge number of consumers down there. They don't drink as much clearly per capita as people in Scotland, but they, they do drink iron brew. And again, you know, big question is Scottishness a good or a bad thing when marketing to people in England. And again, probably just come to the really clear conclusion. It is what it is. It's part of the DNA and we shouldn't be trying to hide it. We shouldn't be trying to, sell it on the back of it we should just let it come out naturally i don't know if that answers the question but that that's the approach we we've certainly taken yeah that's great 
Yeah, I hope that's answered that question and that, that can be a couple of paragraphs at least for a chapter in your dissertation. Um, okay, um, <laughs> somebody's asking, are there any vacancies for a research-oriented role at bar for a science graduate? That's a quick, that's a quick question. Yeah, um, unfortunately, I, d I don't think there probably are at the moment. Um, just to explain, um, we have an R&D team um, we actually have quite a large R&D team that works on product development. It's about 20 people. So obviously we're not doing a huge amount of work on, on, on iron brew per se, because you know, it's been the same recipe um, or certainly the same, we call it essence, the, the essence at the heart of the recipe has been the same since 1901. Um, but, you know, we do develop a lot of products, but we also work with a lot of businesses. So, um, you know, flavor houses, juice suppliers, etc. Um, in the development of those products. So sometimes people look at a business and assume that all the skills sit within the business. The reality is quite often businesses will be using other businesses. So for example, um, we don't create our own adverts in the sense that we sit around and come up with them and then do the, we use an agency, you know, Leaf. So you can probably see behind me there, Fanny. So that's the, um, that's the, the jumper from the, the Fanny advert. And that's an example of, you know, you go out to the agency with a brief, brief came, uh, the script came back from the agency. The, the, the challenge is to choose the right ones. And, you know, read the script to Fanny, oh, this, this is great. You know, we've got to make this up. It was never intended initially to go on television. It was made up as a, just a digital online ad. And then when the performance came through and we saw it, it was just like, got to put that on television. Um, so we put it on television. Perhaps going back to the question around digital marketing and the pace of things, at the time Coke were doing um, a number of bottles where they put names on them. I don't know if people remember that. Yeah. Um, so it was a bit of fun and just online, we mocked up a can and wrote the word Fanny on the side and posted it. And I remember getting off the train in Glasgow Central Station and my phone going, it was a marketing director calling me up saying, Jonathan, it's gone crazy. So what do you mean? It's a million shares, 12,000 people saying, where can they buy this? And a, quite a good lesson in terms of how we have to compete because at the end of the day, you know, we are a much smaller business than these global giants. Um, we managed to launch bottles with Fanny labels on them into the market 24 hours later. And we made up 500,000 bottles, the glass bottles, and put them into stores. And of course they sold through incredibly quickly, but the ability to make a decision like that and move at that pace, there's, a, there's an expression um, in nature. If you look, it's not the big animals that eat the small ones. It's the fast animals that eat the slow ones. Yeah. And I think in business and particularly in business now that that's a huge aspect of it. Brilliant. And do you think as an economist that, um, Anybody who managed to purchase one of those fanny bottles, if they keep on to them, what would the, what do you think they will increase in value to? That's I point. don't, I don't know, but I've got twelve in the garage behind me, so I hope, uh, <laughs> I hope they do. I'm no, not okay. I think, I'm I think most, most of them will have been drunk. Okay, um, right. Another question that we often, when we're talking to students, will tell them that their degree discipline isn't as important as they maybe think. And I think about when I started in this work. Oof, way back in the, in the 90s, uh, when you were graduating, I think, um, the percentage of, the, of, of jobs which required any degree discipline was about 40, 43%, and now that's about 65% and it's growing. So somebody said, you studied economics and went on to work in a different capacity. Clearly, your well-rounded knowledge base has helped you in your career, but what do you feel are some of the most important areas to be cognizant of, regardless of your main field of study? in the context of career mobility and enrichment of life in general. So I suppose to rephrase that question a bit is, I think really saying, if, degree, if your degree discipline isn't quite so important, then what, what do you think are the most important traits that you might need to succeed in your career? Yeah, so um, I, again, probably letting in a little bit of an interviewing secret. I always, when I get a CV, immediately turn and look to see what people got in there. And again, show my age, O level or GCSE or hires um, or A level maths. I always think it's quite an interesting thing to, to, to look at. Um, and, and often um, people going into a commercial career, you are going to have to work with numbers. 
you're not necessarily going to have to do the type of maths that you needed to do. You know, you're walking along and you want to work out how tall the lighthouse is. It's not that sort of maths. It's a mental agility that, you know, you are looking for in people. And, and sometimes you can get an indicator from that, you know, just, just what they've, um, you know, what, what they've got in terms of that um, qualification. Um, that's just a small point I tend to look at. In terms of what's the defining factor in people's career success, it's undoubtedly leadership. So the ability to lead, the ability, and, and people I think have a very, um, <clears throat> you know, they tend to think leadership is all about standing up and shouting from the rooftop and, you know, please come follow me and I'm bright and, you know, probably that's not really what leadership about. You know, leadership is about patiently and often quietly envisioning others, energizing others, and increasingly, um, the more senior you get, enabling others. So helping other people to achieve and empower people to achieve. Um, and yeah, so for me, leadership is the defining factor in, in how far people go typically in their careers. I think that's great and I really, really like your definition of leadership there because I think that's really important for people to grasp that, um, you know, if they've, if they've got, if students have got examples of where they've led, but led in the way that you've described, where they're taking people with them, they've encouraged people, and a lot of people are, you know, are in clubs and societies and they've got to come up with a strategy for that club and society to keep it going, they'll have to take people with them, have to work as a team, for example, and there's loads of examples, but that's a really good answer, so thanks very much. Somebody's asked quite a few questions um, and I, I feel I owe them to get one of them in. Do you know the iron brew recipe and will you please tell us? Um, the answer is no and no. Um, obviously, with the first one being no, uh, genuinely people, people think this is marketing um, bollocks, but it's absolutely true. You know, Robin and Julie Barr make all the iron brew essence. Um, they go and lock themselves away. Um, and, you know, they make it once every couple of weeks or so um a huge massive container full of all this iron brew essence that then gets exported actually all around the world um and they know the secret there is one other uh who knows the secret and it is written down and stored in a bank vault should something go dramatically wrong um but yeah i i very much don't want to know the secret because i don't think i'd ever have another alcoholic drink ever again <laughs> thanks for that um, right we've, we've kind of answered this question in a way but I think the person might benefit from just hearing it said again from you but <clears throat> do you believe that with a BSc in neuroscience I could possibly go on to pursue a career in marketing in the future and if yes would there be a suggested academic route would that be required or whatever? yeah so look very specifically around sales or marketing um, you what, what you do academically will get you to a point. But to be honest, you do not have to have a related subject. So when I joined PNG, there were people who had done degrees in history, in music, um, you know, a, a credibly wide range of, of degree subject. And, you know, what these businesses are really looking for, they assume you're clever. Okay, some of them will give you a, a test where you have to prove that you're clever. Um, problem solving test. Um, I remember at Cambridge, actually, um, I, we did actually have quite a lot of students fail the problem solving test. And it tended to be students who come from a maybe a social science background or a, a, a sort of English a, a writing background who hadn't done maths for three years. And then suddenly half the test is all maths. And, and they struggled with that part of it. And you could see that coming through. Um, but, you know, the assumption is you're bright enough. Okay. We're looking for those personal qualities. We're looking for you to demonstrate those. PNG used to call them what count factors, competences. Okay. And as I said, what you've done in the past is the best example of what you're going to do in the future. The other thing I would say about being in an interview situation is be honest um, and, you know, if you've worked at Tesco stacking shelves, because that's what you needed to do to fund your degree, you just be absolutely clear about that. You know, you know, 
and I and I worked at Tesco. Well, why didn't you do the internship at the investment bank? Well, it's actually because I needed to pay my bills. And and you'll get a lot of respect for being honest and open about those sort of things. Um, so I'd encourage you to do that. In terms of going back to the marketing question, it's almost as if you 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 you'll study marketing or you'll do your other degree. It doesn't matter when you join one of these sort of big businesses and they talk about blue chip FMCG businesses. It's almost like you start in university again. And and certainly at PNG, I felt it was almost like being in in a university. It was almost like doing a postgraduate degree, but of course it was incredibly practical. And you know, you will learn. And it's the ability to think, it's the ability to show those qualities coupled with the experience you'll be given that will develop in your marketing competences. Brilliant, that's a great answer. Somebody's wanting to, has obviously listened to the beginning of this and it's in their mind, it's take you back a long, long way here. It says, could you elaborate a little on what your experience as a research assistant in the House of Commons was like? And I suppose I'd add a supplementary to that. How did how did that then make you realise you didn't want to get into politics? So if you could tell us a bit about that. I know it was a long time ago, but if you could, that'd be great. Yeah, well, Mrs Thatcher was Prime Minister, so it was definitely a long time ago. Um, but yeah, look, I, I it was the first sort of job I had. Um, and, you know, it, it was just a great experience, a great opening to, to the world of work. Um, you know, I can't remember how old I was, what was I, 18? And I found myself in positions that probably an 18 year old should not have found themselves in, um, you know, listening to constituencies, challenges and, you know, organizing events. Um, I remember the dangerous dog bill was going through at the time and I had to organize a constituency event so everybody could come along and share their views with the MP. Didn't quite realize they'd all bring a dog with them. Uh, but these sort of things, you know, and, and it, 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 it was just a great experience in terms of the, the politics piece um you got a really good insight into into obviously how politics really works um i think i tended to see the fact that strangely some of the politicians from other parties got on better with each other than the politicians within the same party that was quite a surprise um but yeah no it it, it, it was more what i learned was you know as there was obviously roles in the civil service etc but they were all graduate entry so it was on the back of that, right, okay, I better go and uh, go and study somewhere. Good, and I'm good. glad I did, it was the right it thing. Sounds like a pretty amazing experience though, and one that you, you, would, you would learn a lot about yourself on, I think. Yeah. Okay, John, well listen, we're, we're nearly running out of time, so I'd just like to ask you one, one final question. Thank you to everybody who's um, contributed and asked questions, they've been fantastic. Um, yeah, I just suppose, I mean, you've talked a lot about the past and where you are now and all of that, but looking forward from here, how do you see your future? What kind of, what what are your priorities now, uh, and what do you see yourself doing going forward? Yeah, well, look, I think firstly, in terms of um, um, AG Bar and work, it, it it's uh, a tough time to be on the the, the bridge of the ship um, for any business, and you know I think it's really good. We have a, a great sort of experienced group of uh, leaders in our business. And, you know, I think that's going to serve the business well as we navigate through what undoubtedly will you know, continue to be choppy waters, if not huge gigantic sort of waves crashing over the ship. So there's a lot of work I want to, to make sure that we do on uh, the, the, the business that I'm involved in. I'm very passionate about, um, you know, I want to see the people in the business continue to develop as well. That's a, that's a hugely important part of it. <clears throat> Um, and there's stuff outside work, you know, um, I'd like to see Scotland be a full test member uh, in terms of the cricket. Um, that would be an objective that I would like to work towards and how I can support that happen. Um, I'm very passionate about education. I, I believe that um, academic world and the business world could benefit hugely more from each other. And, you know, I'm want to try and facilitate that happening and, and that's why I'm involved with the University of Strathclyde and, and vice versa you know I think the more that students can get involved with businesses the better so yeah look still plenty to do still plenty to get up in the morning and and, and sort of you know focus on um, 
and you know enjoy enjoy my work and and look i I'd, I'd like to thank everybody for for joining the as participants i hope they've they've taken something out of this um it isn't a great time at the moment to be out there looking for work and jobs and you know i think everyone recognizes that but i would want to say to people look you know i do again think that we will recover from this and you know i think the economy will recover quicker than people perhaps expect it to um and you know it's a long term a career is a long term thing and and view it like that so whether staying in education for a period of time is the right thing to do or you know actually you might have to do a job that isn't the dream job and you know what if you turn up an interview in 4 years time and somebody says well why did you do that for a year you've got a very good reason to sit there and say because it was better than sitting at home watching daytime television you know it's not what i wanted to do but you know what it's what i had to do um and you'll also you'll also develop whatever you do you'll develop so i would encourage people to to try and do that as well thanks so much Jonathan. well listen i have to say i've really really enjoyed today's session i, I think um i know that we, we we come up with these phrases about what we want out of big brave presenters but you've certainly met those met those bars if i can use that terrible um, pun um, and I think it's been really great to listen to you. And I, I just think for all of the students, I'm sure you've gained a lot from this. And just to hear Jonathan's outlook on life, his definition of leadership is something that I won't forget. And I think that it's really, really important. So I think what you've, what you've really said to me is that students looking at this should be thinking, I can be that person. I can do that. I, and and, and give, give them this great encouragement for that. And that's really what Big Brave is, is all about. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, and despite everything that's going on, you've been really encouraging and really positive and given a really positive message, which is what we really need to hear just now. So thank you very much, Jonathan. And I think we'll just close now. And if you can all give Jonathan a virtual round of applause, I'll just clap myself in my, in my room. Um, thank you very much in today's close. And as I said, if we hadn't, didn't get to your questions, sorry about that, but we will answer them uh, as soon as we can afterwards. And if you want to email us with any other questions that are there, then please do. But Thank you very much for coming and see you at the next big break. Thank you. Okay, thank you.